good morning everyone uh, i feel very glad to welcome you all to the 12th panel of creative theory colloquium the session is titled as issues of labor in contemporary india the session will be chaired by dr arun kumar who is a former faculty at cesp jnu we have three speakers in line the first is dr chirishri das gupta she is a faculty at cslg jnu followed by dr vibhuti patel who is the vice president at indian association for women studies and a former faculty at tis mumbai a third speaker is dr shuchi bharti who is a faculty at asian law college dr shuchi will also be the coordinator uh, will also be the coordinator for the session i would now request dr shuchi to take over the session and start by introducing the theme of the panel over to you shuchi ma'am thank you thank you so much uh, yogita um i hope i'm audible to everyone okay so i extend my sincere gratitude to the team of creative theory colloquium for providing me this great opportunity of coordinating the session which has the presence of scholars of the country who have extensively worked for the cause for different cause and this panel specifically has people who have worked for the cause of labor in india and who are uh, also my mentors and teachers who have inspired me uh, and their work and writings i have followed and referred to from the beginning of my own academic life since today so thank you again uh, regarding today's uh, panel on contemporary issues of labor in india i would like to briefly introduce the theme uh so what we what we have transplanted in india is the quest of uh, prioritizing capital and undercutting the workers rights question against this backdrop the aim of panel discussion is the exploration into the transformations changing place uh, taking place in the nature of work uh, states attitude socio political and economic realities the judicial reasoning and interpretations proposed vis-a-vis -vis the changes and impacts in india the objective is to look at the significant challenges posed to labor and as well as the socio economic responses of this ongoing transformations labor and employment in the present context is observed to be surrounded by challenges of existential turmoil in india a changing scaffold of labor market entails the ease of hire and fire and diffuse an all encompassing definition of what constitute works work the proposal of labor reforms has not been welcomed with the equal cordiality by a worker as it has been praised by the capital the state proclaims the rationale of the reforms to put to the capital and labor at the same plinth uh, but the problem is that irrespective of the constant claims the action shows otherwise uh, what fails the state to harness the trust of the workers is an important question as state claims to facilitate fairness while respecting the free enterprise through the flexibility being great of the great for the worker rhetoric the unflinching support to the techno authoritarian state cap state and capital alliance under the disguise of being non interventionist and for the good for the working class continues so the rationale of this uh, panel of the colloquium has been drawn from varieties of intertwined attributes that compels the academia to inquire the subject more vigorously and closely while assessing the conundrum of policy governance politics economics and other underpinnings of the contemporary issues of labor in india so without any further delay i invite uh, the chair of the session professor arun kumar sir for the commencement of the panel uh thank you suchi for uh, inviting me and i thank the organizer for inviting me to this uh, workshop uh i'll just make a few opening remarks and then we can uh, begin with the panelists uh now what i want to say is that uh today or rather for the last 30 years we've been following the new liberal paradigm of policies uh and that explains a lot of what is happening vis-a-vis -vis labor and workers uh as uh, argued uh, by me in several articles uh, our policies are today based on what is called the supply side policies rather than demand side policies now supply side policies are those that are not for increasing supply but that are supposed to benefit the businessmen so that they can invest more and that is what would then uh, move the economy to a higher growth path so that is the underlying basis of uh, policies and you can see that the aatmanirbhar bharat package that was proposed during the 
you know, uh, this um, pandemic in May uh, 2020 uh, of 22 lakh crores, that was also based on supply side policies. And as a part of that package was also the, you know, the labor code that is being introduced, the farmers bills that were introduced and, you know, dependent basically on credit rather than giving more funds to the poor who are suffering as a result of the loss of employment and the loss of incomes that were there. And we have the study from uh, Azim Premji, which showed that 80% workers said that they had lost incomes and 90% said that they did not have enough funds to buy one week of supplies. And that's why they were starving. And that's why we saw uh, crores uh, of people marching from cities back to the villages in the hope that they would be able to get some uh, food. So in a sense, the plight of labor today uh, is uh, because of the kind of policies that have been followed since 1991, and more specifically now that these supply side policies that are, uh, uh, that are being pursued. Now, uh, as the World Bank had said, uh, you know, the policies need to be market friendly. Uh, so these are what are called market friendly. So it's not that the state intervention is declined, but state intervention, which was in favor of the poor and uh, others, uh, now it is exclusively in favor of capital. Uh, so this is a, a change that came with the 1991 policies, which was supposed to be market friendly state intervention. Uh, now, the other thing that we need to also look at is that the position of labor has declined all over the world. Uh, and the reason for that is that capital has become dominant given its mobility. Uh, it has become highly mobile. And as a result, it can move quickly from one country to another country, uh, which is offering it concessions. So capital is able to make uh, countries compete against each other. Uh, it is also because of capital's mobility that what is called the race to the bottom in terms of taxation that has come about. Uh, so direct taxes have been cut very sharply. Uh, this began with the collapse of the Soviet Union uh, and the Eastern Bloc. Uh, when you know, they did not have capital in Eastern Bloc of Europe, they started cutting taxes and therefore they started attracting capital. So whether it be Poland or other countries of the Eastern Bloc, but even Ireland uh, cut taxes and capital started going there. So today, Ireland is the uh, place where large number of uh, big corporates like Starbucks and so on are now basing their uh, corporate uh, from there so that they can take advantage of low taxation. This forced other countries, Britain, Germany, France, etc., also to cut taxes. And that had an impact on the public goods provision, whether it be health, education, and so on. Uh, that has also penetrated into the uh, developing world because uh, everybody is competing for capital. So today's financial architecture uh, is what is being used by capital to strengthen itself, and that is weakening labor. So in the IT sector, for instance, uh, you don't have trade unions at all. But more than that, in India, the unorganized sector, which employs 94% of the workforce, did not have you know, uh, mobilization as uh, you know, trade unions, and they could not bargain for their rights. So it's a very tiny section in India, which was actually able to mobilize and ask for their rights. So the weakness was already there. And I call the unorganized sector, the reserve army of labor, which actually keeps the organized sector labor also very weak because the salary differentials between the organized and the unorganized sector can be anywhere uh, five times to 10 times. So if you lose a job in the organized sector, you'll slip into the unorganized sector at you know, 20% or 10% of the salary that you were getting earlier. So you don't want to lose that position. And that keeps the organized sector also a weak uh, in the Indian context. Uh, so the, the question to ask is this weakening of labor, you know, uh, how is that affecting the position of labor? And that weakening is continuing further with the labor code that is proposed uh, by the government, uh, which the labor unions are uh, opposing but it doesn't appear that it is having much of an effect because state after state is uh, adopting these labor codes. And now, you know, it might be adopted uh, uh, in the country as a whole. So the difficulties in mobilization of the unorganized sector 
is something that the organized sector needs to take care of because without that, the organized sector also remains weak. Uh, another factor that needs to be considered in all this is, uh, apart from the international finance capital and its mobility, the technology. Uh, there's a rapid development in technology which is displacing labor. Uh, so, for instance, you have you know autonomous vehicles being uh, uh, experimented with and very likely to come in within the next few years, which will displace you know millions of truck drivers all over the world. Uh, not that it's, it it will get implemented everywhere uh, equally fast, but the potential threat is there. Uh, similarly, in India, we have seen that our neighborhood. Uh, stores are being displaced by uh, the e-commerce. You know, before the pandemic, a large number of people used to go to the stores uh, of the middle class. And do not allow anyone who is not known. I think uh, general keep them in the waiting say, room. Yeah, keep them in the waiting room. So, you know, as I was saying, technology has become the big disruptor uh, and it's weakening labor because it's creating massive uh, unemployment uh, all over the world, not just in India, but all over the world. Uh, and you know, that weakness is something that we also need to understand. So, you know, uh, I think uh, we need to address this question. How is the labor's consciousness formed? You know, uh, how is it that uh, that consciousness transcends into movements? Uh, so, uh, you know, these are some of the issues that I thought I'd flag, uh, which, you know, the speakers could, uh, you know, uh, address apart from whatever else they have in mind which they are anyway going to address. Uh, so thanks uh, for this thing. And I'll make my remarks later on. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, sir, for the enlightening opening remarks. Now I would uh, invite Professor Chirashi Das Gupta for, uh, for her paper presentation. And along with that, I would also request Yogita to be ready with the slides whenever uh, Professor Chirashri uh, instructs you to play them. So over to you, ma'am. Okay, thank you. Uh, am I audible? Yes. yes. Okay. Uh, uh, good morning, uh, friends. I'm very grateful to the uh, uh, Creative Theory Colloquium for getting me back once again after a brief hiatus. And especially grateful to uh, Savita and Manindra and uh, Shuchi, as, uh, especially for thinking of me for this panel. I have a bad cold, so I may sound a little throaty. Uh, uh, Yogita, I request you to please put on the slide so that I don't waste any time in making that. Okay, so my uh, presentation is titled State and Capital uh, in, in India, actually, Institutions of Labor Cheapening. And I, next slide, please. And uh, Yogita, next slide. And I'll start with some data, which is about how the value that is produced in India uh, has over time, like what has been the share of the workers especially and what has been the share of capitalists uh, which is called the operating surplus so as you know that mainly it breaks up into two major portions all value that is created the part that is paid as wages and also other kinds of compensation because we don't get separate uh, data on just wages and the rest accrues to the capitalist as operating surplus from which they pay let us say interest, etc., and then the, and other spendings, and retain the rest as profits. So, if you see from the period 1988 to 1992, 93, from the time we have consistent comparable data, uh, the share of employees was about 56 percent in that, that uh, entire 12 years, and the share of employers was about 44 percent. 
But right after liberalization, within two, three years, uh, uh, 19, between 1993, 94 to 1999, 2000, the share of compensation of employees came down to 35%. Between 2004, 5 to 2011, 12 came down further to just 30 percent, and then uh, increased a little bit as far as the private organ uh, corporations, which is like the organized sector is concerned, to about 36 percent. And consistently, what you can see is that the share of the whether it's the organized public sector or where it is private corporations, it is perspective of series. But there has been a huge reversal in terms of the uh, uh, the, the share of wages and compensation decline. I know. Yeah, it's uh, absolutely. Uh, it's coming now. Yeah, it's absolutely fine. Uh, so please go to the next slide. So the point I was making is that, as you can see, that within three years after the big liberalization of 1991, uh, the compensation of employees drastically, the percentage share went down. Uh, and there was a reversal. And if you take that decadal thing from 2011, 12 to 2019, 20 overall, like uh, in the economy, then the workers' share has come down to about 38%, while the employer's share is around 62%. Okay? So this reversal, in some ways, actually has a very important dimension in terms of the, uh, the points that were made by Professor Arun Kumar in terms uh, of about what has been happening in the last three decades as far as workers are concerned. That out of the value that is created in the economy, the share of workers is consistently dec uh, drastically declined and then remained consistent at a level, which is like uh, uh, almost half of what it used to be till 1992-93. Next slide, please. Uh, uh, we can skip this. I've already talked about it, the next one. So now I go, go into the, like, uh, some other, uh, other kinds of data, uh, a different kind of data. This is from the annual survey of industries. And I request you to follow this a little. This is the one that will take a little bit of time, but this is central to the arguments that I'm going to make, which is that if you take the second column, which is wages to total value of output. So in 1989-90, uh, for every 100 rupees of value that was produced, see, uh, 6 rupees 54 paise used to go to labor. Okay, because this is just pure wages. Because what I was showing you earlier, was wages plus salaries plus other kinds of compensation. So it actually includes even those inflated CEO salaries. Okay? And that means that if you take that out, the actual share of labor would be even smaller than what I showed you. So here we get a more uh, rounded idea from the annual survey of industries. And what you see is that by the 2013-14, uh, this had reduced to less than two rupees. And the value value of two rupees today is much less than the value of, because these are current prices, two rupees in 89.90, right? So basically for every 10 rupees of value that is produced in the economy, just 23 paisa on an average goes to labor. So this is the extent to which labor cheapening has taken place in India. And labor cheapening is the basis of accumulation in India. And this is something that is at a level where uh, it is uh, uh, like uh, uh, if you see the decline has been more than threefold. Now, then I move to the third column, which is net value added to wages, which is kind of a proxy of what Marx called the rate of exploitation, which was surplus how like for every rupee of wages paid how much is the surplus that is created and so you can see that in uh 1989-90 for every 100 rupees of wages 283 percent of value added in which which would go into the making of surplus was paid in. today by 2013-14 this was more than 700 and today it is around uh, 2017-18 it is six 
37. So once again, you can see that just as the share of wages has declined threefold in total value, the rate of exploitation in a certain base has uh, increased almost threefold. Okay. Now, then we go to the last uh, column, which is material inputs to wages. So this also gives uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, what Marx called the organic composition of capital. And even if you don't, or the technical composition of capital, but it can also be in liberal terms uh, thought of as technology intensity. And what you can see is that over time, like the capital labor ratio, you can think of it in other ways as the capital labor ratio has also increased okay, from 12 to about 14, 2014, 15. But then that is also decreasing. And this is something I'm leaving uh, uh, for exploration because we need more data to really ascertain whether we are going back to a regime that is uh, labor more labor intensive and other evidence seems to suggest so as uh, and the reason that is happening is you can see is in the uh, uh, second last column because while the rate of exploitation has increased the operating surplus the share of operating surplus has increased in the post liberalization period there has been a decline in the rate of profit for capital, which suggests that capital in India actually is seeing a tendency of decline in the rate of profit to the point where it is at 11% uh, in 2017 18. So it suggests not a, a simple, there is an expansion of uh, absolute profits as we see, it, but also indicates a certain kind of crisis of profitability as far as Indian capital is concerned. And however, don't mistake this to think that like their absolute profits are declining. So out of the net value added, what they are doing is they're appropriating more, more and more capitalist profit. So in uh, 1989, 90, just 19% of the net value added accrued as profit, while today it is about 47, 46%. Next slide, please. So in this background, I want to put my main argument borrowing from Pulan Sass, that this suggests over time, a shrinking of the relative autonomy of the state and a shift in the balance of class forces in terms of the narrowing of the class basis of the Indian nation state in favor of capital as against labor. Now, in this, I want to particularly examine how labor cheapening, and I'm not going to talk so much about policy uh, because policy is something I really believe and I've argued elsewhere that uh, policy changes in itself do not augur much unless you look at underlying institutional continuities and changes. And so I'm going to focus my short presentation on the reliance on labor cheapening and the institutions that have been harnessed for this, which uh, while Shruti mentioned non-intervention, I would argue that both intervention, selective intervention and largely non-intervention, both together have been cleverly used to maintain labor cheapening as the sole basis of accumulation in India, which continued from the previous previous decades and intensified in the period under consideration that is in the period of neoliberalism. And this is particularly true of the last decade and I want to make certain uh, additional points about that as we go along. Next slide please. So the first uh, legal institution that I want to bring to your notice is the Industrial Disputes Act of 1947 which was adopted in October. 1947, two months after independence by the Constituent Assembly, and in which basically all employer employee uh, relations, regardless of what the workplace was. So, from domestic workers to workers in places of worship to, to factory workers to service sector workers, everybody uh, was covered by the Industrial Disputes Act, which gave not only certain kinds of rights. Uh, to workers, but also this is the most universal form of workers' right that was ever given in India. 
but the chambers of commerce like FIKI, etc., right from the beginning started opposing this. And through a series of events, which I'm, I, for lack of time, I don't want to go into, but if you want to know, we can later in the discussion bring those up. By 1956, FIKI created enormous pressure on the government and the government of the day. And by 1956, the new Industrial Disputes Act was brought in, which defined the worker through the workplace. And the workplace is, is defined by a certain size of factory with a certain capacity of horsepower. And accordingly, the workers was defined. So essentially, it meant that male uh, factory workers in certain kinds of not even micro or small enterprises, but certain bigger factories. And this is how informality was institutionalized in India, okay? right in the first decade after independence. And so this idea that informalization has increased is true. But if you look at, at independence, the ratio between formal and informal was 40 to 60. But today that is, as you know, like, five is to 95 and the institutionalization of this particular uh, way of progress through informal informality as the dominant form of labor deployment is something that was institutionalized right after independence the second point that i want so this was a selective intervention the second point is the non-intervention which is uh, the graded hierarchy of labor that existed on the basis of caste, the, uh, the, uh, the co-constitution of caste, patriarchy, and class was something that was kept intact without any kind of, so, so while untouchability became a crime, but caste system itself was not criminalized, right? And so basically the caste and patriarchy as the basis of a great maintaining what Ambedkar called the graded hierarchy, I call it the graded hierarchy of labor, in particularly social uh, reproduction, was maintained to keep labor cheap. And I want to bring just two examples of like, I, uh, I did a survey between 2018 and uh, to 2020 till the, uh, about the first month of the pandemic of uh, about 2, 1,800 domestic workers and 300 sanitation workers in various institutions as well as home deployment. And uh, uh, what we find is that three things. The first is the huge difference between the in compensation wage or income compensation between in institutions, between the top, like take uh, JNU, where what I found was the average salary of the top player of the uh, that is the faculty members, the average salary across uh, positions is about 1,20,000, while that of the uh, sanitation workers were uh, 3,000 to 6,000. So this level of inequality is something, uh, similarly for domestic workers, what I found was uh, not more than 4% of the household income is spent on the uh, wages paid to domestic workers. This can only be explained, and I've argued once again in my uh, work elsewhere, that is based on the definition of skills, which uh, is defined by the state through the national skills, uh, uh, the definition of skills and uh, hierarchization of skills which is based on a pure Brahminical distinction between mental and manual labor. Okay. Then the third is that I want to, uh, the second is how unpaid work is mobilized through paid work. So two examples, domestic workers are actually uh, uh, contracted for piece work, cleaning, cooking, uh, 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 washing utensils. And there is a, uh, for each, kind of work, there is a certain monthly rate. However, once they come into the house, they are made to do many other jobs or jobs, okay, which are not part of that unofficial contract. So from watering plants to 
uh, my child care, like uh, holding the baby, looking after the baby, to making tea, etc. Many things which are actually unpaid work mobilized through paid work. Okay? Uh, so there is a continuum between paid and unpaid work. Similarly, for sanitation workers in institutions, like they are mobilized at odd job persons. So they just don't do sanitation work. So when there are events, they, serve, they are made to serve tea, they are made to pull furniture, made part of the organizing thing, and all of this once again is unpaid labor. So the, the third that I want to talk about, and I'll just touch on this and go on, which is that things like jodi labor. This is emergent new forms of bondage where husband and wife and the kid comes free are contracted as a family in construction sites. And obviously the uh, rate that would have been paid to the, if they were working as individuals separately is much less than what is paid as a family because the woman's work is uh, undervalued. And Sumangali labor, you may know, which is, uh, uh, there's a lot of work on it now, which is young women are contracted to raise their dowries for three to four years uh, to work in a hosiery industry, which is largely an export-oriented industry, who live in chattel slavery-like conditions with uh, like immense kind of violence, starvation, sexual violence, etc., and subjected to uh, unregulated work and even though this is now legally uh, uh, sort of has been banned because of uh, voices being raised internationally uh, uh, because this is an export oriented industry still this custom is very much pervading and these are fastest growing sites of accumulation this fastest growing sectors of the economy like construction and uh, you know, export oriented uh, 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 textile industry. Next slide, please. Uh, the uh, last three points I want to make is, apart from this, there is the pattern of labor intensification in the name of flexibility. And we are all familiar with this, various modes of contractualization that has happened over time. And Basically, the fundamental right to form unions has been taken away by increasingly raising the number of minimum people needed to form a union. Earlier it was seven, and now then they increased this to 100, and then it has been increased further. And so what you now have is, it is very difficult to form unions in itself, which would be recognized Indians, uh, unions, and moreover, the tripartite negotiation system of states, capitalist organizations, and government, uh, which, which was put in place after independence, is something that has been eroded completely. And added to this is, of course, the dispossession, deprivation, and accumulation that we've seen over time. And this has intensified under neoliberalism. Uh, from Vedanta to like a huge number of uh, examples that we can take and which the more displacement takes place, the more, the more vulnerable labor becomes and it is more easy to then or like uh, cheapen labor because if you are so vulnerable, if your vulnerability increases, you are willing to work on very, very onerous terms because there is no collective bargaining possible on your behalf. Now, added to this, in the last, uh, under the present regime, in the last, uh, since 2015, I would say 16, uh, what we see is a new form that is emerging, and I want to spend just a, just a couple of minutes on this, which I called insecure citizenship through document terrorism. So, A, you label a certain section of the population especially Muslim minorities, but also Christians and others, uh, as people who are of, uh, like, uh, uh, who are uh, designated as foreigners, who are designated as not enough citizens in various ways. There is a social license to lynch, kill, kill rape. This has also happened to Dalits. And this then leads directly to uh, not only, of course, the physical violence 
weapons and harm which is always talked about and the threat of, of uh, like physical security etc but this creates an entire group of insecure citizens and of course things like the caa and the nrc then create a kind of document terrorism to further strengthen this insecure citizenship and if you look at the uh, if you take parallels from what what happened to Mexicans and Latinos, for example, in the USA, it is similar that you keep people so insecure as citizens that they can't claim even citizenship rights, leave alone labor rights, and through violence, they are dispossessed and they are uh, offered like uh, whatever little security they had in terms of economic security also goes. And then this adds further to the process of labor cheapening because then uh, like building up new livelihoods uh, would be very difficult and hence once again you create an entire new pool of people who will work at very very low rates so all of these institutional processes actually shows that this entire project is not merely a polit political it is a political project but it is a political project in favor of big capital to facilitate labor cheapening by deploying caste and patriarchy and now religion as well. But what we can see is that there is a crisis of profit rates, which I started with, as I showed you, a real crisis because if you go on cheapening and depressing wages so much, then after it, real wages so much, over time you erode workers abilities to buy and hence there is a demand compression in the economy which is bound to then lead to a crisis of profitability so it is a very delicate balance and this system as i showed you that if you are paying 23 pesa for every 10 rupees of output labor is virtually free in india so and still the rate of profitability is falling so in this situation, it is a very delicate balance of social engineering that is going on. But if this economic pressure keeps building in terms of demand compression and people being destituted over time, then it can collapse at any moment. And so this building towards that rupture to really bring about that time where this institutional basis of accumulation can be ruptured from below in terms of a more favorable conditions for labor is what uh, I think all of us and the social and labor movements and political movements, progressive political movements need to work for. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Shirashri ma'am. And now I would uh, request Professor Bhuti Patel to uh, kindly begin. I think Professor Patel, you have to unmute yourself. First of all, I would like to thank Professor uh, Savita Singh and Dr. Yogita Agarwal uh, for this opportunity to be part of uh, an esteemed panel curated by Creative Theory Colloquium 2022 and organized by Creative Theory Association with International uh, Herbert Marcus Society. I have a PowerPoint presentation and I would like the right to share my PPT. Uh, I'm disabled to share the PPT. Ah, will I be allowed? Allowed in, in one minute. Yeah. So, so my presentation uh, focuses on Yes, ma'am, check. You yes, are not it, able to share your screen. Yes, I'm able to see it. Yes. So, as you can see, my presentation is focused on gender and labor uh, concerns and it is informed by the theoretical framework of critique of neoliberal macroeconomic policies as I think in the concept note I think Dr. Arun Kumar also emphasized uh, human development approach and right-based approach uh, intersectional gender perspective and, and need for engendering macro meso and microeconomies to ensure dignified life to the working class and also for the recent debate 
uh, about Ravidi culture and freebies. I think we need a paradigm shift from this kind of uh, frivolous discourses to proactive action agenda for the right to food, right to education, right to employment, right to skill, right to social security and social protection, and the freedoms from hunger, malnutrition, inaccessible education, skills, uh, uh, and diseases, freedom from diseases. Now, coming to the question of a demographic reality, we know that the sex ratio is currently, you know, the, as per the Niti Aayog data, it is a uh, alarmingly adverse. Uh, at one level, birth rate is going down. More than 20 states are below stabilization. That means uh, couples are producing less than two children, uh, but the price is paid by the girl child. And uh, we also have a major uh, challenges of the reproductive health because of two years of pandemic, all the reproductive health services were uh, dismantled. And uh, what we need is a, uh, uh, and a previous session as it showed that how public health system has been uh, attacked severely with the neoliberal influence in the healthcare sector. Now, the, uh, this uh, graph also told, uh, shows us that both birth rate and death rate have gone down in India. Uh, malnutrition is a major problem which the working class is facing. Anemia among women uh, 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 is more than 50 to 60 percent and resulting in a maternal mortality rate. And uh, every three men using healthcare facilities in city of Mumbai, we see uh, uh, only one woman uses it. So there is a one third utilization of healthcare facilities by women. And uh, nutrition is a major challenge that they are facing. When it comes to the education sector, most of the working class population and the labor, they are facing major challenges. As they, currently three crore Indian children are out of school, out of which one, one crore are women. So getting last moment connectivity in this so-called online or a hybrid form of education is a major challenge. And whatever uh, gains that we had over the last 50, 150 years of uh, uh, education journey. Uh, I think they have been wiped out and we, we, this is a major challenge. India's promise to sustainable development goal in that also we see that currently nearly uh, one a fourth of the women are not able to access higher education. Persons with disability are facing major a challenge in all their developmental needs. Gender-based violence has escalated. Now it is in this con and people with disability, they are also facing none of the citizenship rights are available to them. And uh, we need to, the whole question of gender binary of just Coming up with the policy intervention only for men and women leaves out the sexual minorities, especially the transgender population and their developmental needs. So it is in this overarching reality that we need to locate the work participation. And I think my previous speaker has also given an exhaustive uh, and convincing uh, database about how the labor, uh, labor is cheapening, labor is losing out. 92% of the workforce uh, is in the informal sector. And there is a gender gap also. There is a defeminization uh, in the agricultural sector, in the urban, uh, in, in the uh, informal sector, the condition is very, very precarious. 40% of women who were earlier in a pre-pandemic period were in the work, labor force, they are out of work. Uh, massive occupational diversification is taking place in the Indian economy and occupational segregation results into segmentation of women in the low pay, dead end, mon monotonous, uh, employment and there are mobility constraints so the UNDP studies have also shown women in a digital economy they are also at the lowest bottom of the pyramid and the, the, the where there are hardly any chances of professional growth none of the training programs out of more than 250 training programs by the Industrial Training Institute. Most of the time women are segregated only in the, uh, say, tailoring or screen printing. None of the other skills are given. There is a major data crisis because visibility of gender in statistics and indicators, uh, that is a major challenge that we are facing. Even in the discourse on migration, the focus was on male migration. When it comes to even labor codes, the whole language of the labor codes, four labor codes, whether it is about the wages or labor standards or industrial relations, social security, social protection. There is hardly any mention of women. The whole language is in terms of he, him, and he's. Only when it comes to maternity benefits, they have mentioned it. Even sexual harassment at workplace, which is a major challenge in the informal sector and also in the organized sector, there is no, no, no 
you are talking about it. When it comes to sanitation and recycling work, which needs a major technological intervention, none of the state governments except Kerala and uh, Delhi to some extent have uh, brought in new technology. Uh, more. Uh, women who are in the in the workforce, they are facing uh, various, as you can see in the various rounds of NSSO, that how the uh, occupational structure is changing. So in the primary sector, the, uh, there is a defeminization from 1983 to 84, 1983-84, which was 87%, which is reduced to now 73% by 70, uh, 2017-18, while in a uh, secondary sector, there has been an uh, increase from 7% to 13%, and in the service sector, tertiary sector, there is increase from 5% to 13%, but still in the pyramid of the workforce, like a, a hierarchy of the workforce, women are in, in a graded hierarchy. I think the women are at the bottom. Uh, when it comes to unpaid care work, about which for the first time we have a macro level data provided by the um, by, by the Ministry of Statistics and Program Implementation, here this bar chart also shows that how when it comes to un unpaid caregiving, unpaid domestic services, women are, uh, are, are found in a major proportion of women are engaged in and 10 times more energy of women uh, in, uh, is utilized, where Indian women spend 299 minutes per day doing unpaid work while men spend 99 minutes. Uh, so the question of uh, recognition, redistribution of care work, so the changing the gender norms becomes very important. Uh, care work is not only whether it is a child care, elderly care or housework is not only the responsibility of women. We need to make change the mindset of the people and change the gender norms, because even as compared to other Asian countries, this kind of a skewed distribution of care work between men and women is there more pronounced in India even when we compare it with the other South Asian and other Asian, Southeast Asian countries. Recognition of care work, very important, and the measure of time use. Now, for the first time, we have had time use. There are limitations of TUS, this time use service, because it also used the recall method of last for 24 hours of your work. It, it has its own limitation because there is a seasonality in, in Indian economy. Uh, people are doing different activities in different seasons. Uh, and also we need to reduce care work by uh, uh, time labor uh, saving technologies for a drudgery prone, stigmatized and hazardous work. And also those who are into care work, they also should be paid uh, the, the adequate and respectable wages so that they can lead dignified life. Now, feminist political economy of everyday and theorization of social reproduction, uh, of gender structure of everyday power and agency impacting everyday life within the neoliberal individuation has been a major uh, discourse globally as well as in our country in the post-pandemic period and even during the pandemic. So recently we have seen some of the progressive judgments by the family courts where value of homemaking and unpaid care work because when men want to dispose of their middle-aged wives and they said they won't pay a penny because they have cooks and uh, guard, uh, cooks and uh, they, they have uh, uh, domestic workers who do their work. So the courts have given progressive judgments by uh, using time use survey and by using the time allocation that these women have invested over the years in, in, in managing their family and the uh, uh, relationships. Uh, in Chhattisgarh, Himachal Pradesh, Uttar Pradesh high courts, homemakers were compensation for the loss of future prospects. We saw even a very important judgment in 2010 by Supreme Court of India, where uh, Arun Kumar Agarwal versus National Insurance Company Limited, uh, where the wife of Mrs. Renu Agarwal died due to road accident and the insurance company did not want to pay compensation and uh, they were forced because the, the time use analysis was used. So the economists were gender economists were consulted by the judges. In the Madras High Court judgment where Rekha Kotari, Rakhi Kotari versus Sundarappan uh, where the ex again the accident compensation case, uh, housewife who was pregnant uh, and uh, she also uh, uh, and she had abortion as a result of this accident, she was compensated. And we also saw Kirti versus Oriental uh, Insurance Company Limited, in which also value of women's labor and the homemaker was uh, acknowledged by the court. So these are some of the progressive trends that we see. I need to switch on my.
my battery was good. So when it comes to women in informal sector, what we have seen that uh, uh, grim reality of 92% of women in the workforce who are into export-oriented industries, production of leather goods, toys, food products, garment, diamond jewel, uh, jewelry, and uh, artificial jewelry, peace rate female labor employee is employed, and even home-based workers in cities like Mumbai or Madras or uh, Bangalore we have seen. They are, uh, and there are women who are working from the sweatshop. There was a major struggle in Tamil Nadu and Kerala for these women working in the shops, uh, uh, working in the uh, as a sales girl, who were not even allowed to sit there. They had to work for 12 hours a day, but they were not even given bench or a stool to sit. So they, they had, there was a big, uh, they filed public interest litigation. These young women workers got organized and they they uh, won the case in the court. And now they are there. Now they have attain the right to sit imagine these are the sim uh, uh, simple uh, things which which you which any worker would we would take it for granted that when there are no customers you would be allowed to sit but that doesn't happen a condition of domestic workers i think there are n number of studies and rapid assessment studies uh, done during the pandemic and also in the pre-pandemic period, which shows that what we need is a central legislation for domestic workers. Only one state, Mar Maharashtra, has at least done the census of domestic workers, partial census, and they are given I-card, but none of the social security or social protection measures are being granted to domestic workers and asha workers and anganwadi workers they have been applauded by the world health organization they have been rewarded asha workers and we have even uh, declared them as corona war best corona warriors most humane corona warriors but they don't even get minimum wages as for the uh, of the state or you no know, they are given only honorarium and none of the social security benefits are given to them and they have got nationally they have got unionized uh, uh, and they are asserting their rights when it comes to migration in whole discourse on migration invisibility of women becomes very prominent and uh, women migrate uh, and even the data system also shows women uh, migrants only mi women migrate due to marriage when it comes to men the data would say that men mi migrate due to for work or for education but even after getting married wherever they, these women go they are working so that aspect that is not uh, brought in in the economic discourse. And now there are women study scholars who are showing that what were they doing at the native place and what are they doing at the destination place, the profile of their work. Uh, in a smart city discourse, what we need is that housing, urban housing becomes a very important concern for the laboring class because most of this, in most of the cities, 40 to 60 percent of the workforce uh, uh, lives in the sl urban slums without any facility. And we saw the kind of crisis and the human miseries it created during the pandemic. As per 2011 census, in, we had 30.9 million women as migrant workers, that means three crore women who were migrant, but they were classified, 85% of them were classified as migrated due to marriage. But uh, now, the, uh, the what do they do after marriage, uh, uh, what kind of work they are doing, that also needs to be netted. Uh, in the agricultural sector, we see is a defeminization of rural agriculture workforce due to commercialized agriculture, mechanization, and massive land alienation uh, that is happening due to infrastructural projects. Uh, in 2004, 533 percent of women were there in the agriculture sector, which reduced to 25 percent. And in 2018-19, it became 19 percent as agriculture worker. So possibility of underestimation can be uh, there and uh, because women have multiple employers and multiple work. So you may be agriculture worker uh, uh, during the monsoon, but other time you may be working in a construction site or as a road worker or in a domestic work uh, or as helper. So that it is possible. The major challenge is the unequal wages, even when the state is employer. Even in MG Narega, so many studies have shown that um, women are getting sometimes two third or one third of the wages because of the contractors and subcontractors. They also uh, believe uh, in this kind of uh, unequal treatment to women for doing the similar kind of work, or they may be slightly 
uh, different kind of work, which if the men are doing digging, so you pay more wages for digging the pit. But when do, do loading and unloading, you are paying less, which, which is the work which is done by women. Anything work done by women suddenly is classified as unskilled because of this kind of a patriarchal, patriarchal bias of the employers. And they use the patriarchal bias for paying less wages to women. Uh, women farmers don't have identity cards. We have eight percent of women who are uh, who have land ownership right, and uh, unless you own land, you don't get kisan card. So women farmers, even when they are de facto cultivators, they don't get subsidized electricity, fertilizer, subsidized uh, irrigation, or even seeds. So that is a uh, that issue. These issues were brought out during the farmer struggle. Women farmers had their special three day national convention, and they brought out the charter of demand. Employment generation in the agro-processing and uh, economic activities in the non-farm sectors. These are other two very important areas where women are used as the cheapest labor. When it comes to tribal uh, population, 11% of uh, laboring class is in the tribal area. They are based on, uh, uh, their activities are based on forest-based economy and they do collection of forest produce, which contribute to nearly 3,800 crores per annum to the GDP of our country. But still, they, their rights are not, uh, uh, none of their rights, whether as uh, workers or for social protection. In fact, the most, uh, deplorable condition of the workforce is in the tribal areas where uh, uh, they, they don't even have access to food or healthcare facilities or shelter or medicine or cash income. Uh, women in fisheries, they are also facing major crisis because of the uh, multinational giants, transnational giants have entered the field. Women who are the vendors and women who don't have any kind of technology, the fisher folks don't, uh, fisher women don't have any technology or a refrigeration facility. They are the one at the receiving end. The, pro, the shelf life of their products are also very limited. Handloom sector has faced a major uh, attack by even demolition of the uh, handloom board uh, the in any case you know, uh, like over the time right from 1981 uh, when we saw the uh, um, there was a decline of the handloom sector handloom sector is the largest employer of women uh, after agricultural occupation in the rural areas and that is facing major uh, challenge recently and especially after the liberalization where Indian handloom is competing with so many other textiles uh, products which are uh, dumped in the Indian market. Uh, mm -hmm. As a result mm -hmm. of this kind of situation, feminization of poverty, a lot has been mm -hmm. written about feminization of poverty and the women-headed household who are facing major uh, challenge because these are the household managed by widow, separated, single, and unmarried, uh, and uh, women facing long-term male migration. Uh, occupational health and safety is a major casualty uh, in, in the uh, informalization so the problem uh, and also problems of women vendors uh, best recycling workers uh, is very uh, deplorable safety of women at workplace i think that is a, we have a law 2013 law but nothing is happening when it comes to the skill skill india make in india startup india atmanirbhar india where, where women are completely marginalized and there is a demand by the gender economists that at least 30% of the resources in these schemes, flagship schemes should be. Excuse me, ma'am. Yeah, I'm completing. Yeah. Now we are talking about the future of work, gig economy, platform based economy, temping, automation, massive automation and robo or application of robo in the manufacturing sector, artificial intelligence in service sector. I think in this context, women are the major losers because they are, they, they are quote unquote, not job ready as per Niti Ayo. And um, um, my previous speakers have also sp spoken about the labor codes, uh, that how they are detrimental to the interest of women. We are facing major challenge in terms of gender page gap, sexual harassment at workplace, erosion of labor standards evolved by the recent work concept of ILO, uh, occupational health uh, hazards, a uh, hire and fire policy in favor of uh, employer. More than 12 states have started implementing labor codes 
workforce and they have given up labor standards of eight hours of work, eight hours of leisure and eight hours of rest. Uh, as again said, they are demanding 12 to 16 hours of work. There are so many shop floor level struggles uh, happening, but nothing media is not even, there is a complete media uh, blackout and invisibilization of women workers. So it is very important that now we need to uh, have a gender responsive uh, transformative agenda for gender equality. Gender economists are asking for gender, gender responsive budgeting to address the issues of uh, gender gaps in the workforce. And we need the important visibility of gender in statistics and indicators, uh, financial allocation for gender equality, affirmative action for enabling work environment, and protective legislations which have been yeah, won over the last 150 years of collective struggle by the working class. 48 central legislations and 200 state-specific legislation. We have to safeguard them. We have to fight for them and boost the local and uh, uh, local economies and gender mainstreaming in all flagship programs of the state and non-state ventures we have to strive for. So these are some of the references I have used for my PPT. And thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you so much, Professor Patel. I would now like to request Dr. Shuchi Bharti to come in for a presentation. Uh, thank you so much, Yogita, and thank you so much, uh, Professor Patel, for such an elaborated and such important uh, aspects on labor to, to you have presented. So uh, today, after hearing all of you, uh, my uh, presentation would just be an add-on reiterating the arguments that have been in the discourse already. So uh, the work I'm presenting uh, specifically focuses on the few aspects that have always been of paramount importance. And that also sort of pushes the creative theory fraternity to scrutinize the whole idea of projection in the domain of labor and employment. You know how this uh, fine-grained strategic psychological movement towards our understanding of what work and labor meant and what it means is now tweaked. Such proje projections do play a very pivotal role in uh, state and capital partnership and influences the logical interpretations of the minds of the citizenry as well, uh, if not always, but many times. So I would uh, try to uh, make, uh, make it possible to understand that how in the domain of labor and employment, this psychological projection or the strategic manifestation of the definitions of how we understand work, how we feel that, uh, okay, many of us are in, in, in influence that hire and fire is fine for the growth, et cetera, et cetera. We can take up these uh, important aspects um, in, uh, that, is, that could be expected, uh, which I am trying to portray right now. So these creative projections on, uh, on the contrary of actual happening, in or rather manipulates the de facto thinking and understanding process in the minds of people. So my focus would not be only about talking about the changing context of law, regulation, governance, or underlying institutions, but also how there have been strategic manifestation, not only at the level of state, but also at the international governance structure that totally metamorphosizes the thinking and believing uh, of multiple aspects of work, labor, and employment such as what employment means to us, what being in precarious employment means, uh, and what about modern threats uh, to the workers, such as automation, and the skilling, feminization of work, and many other related aspects can come under this whole gambit of the projected strategic uh, manifestation, which I want to talk about. So uh, I would try to, uh, we are already going ahead of time, but I would try to stick to the time limit. And uh, my focus would be primarily in our, around few central points, understanding the strategic manifestation of how the state and international governance arena have defined and redefined the meaning and interpretation of work. Um, and there has also been a heavy re-regulatory activities happening that clearly paves way to the techno-authoritarian alliance between the state and capital. So which, what does this techno-authoritarian alliance do? It sort of disowns or vilifies the pro-collective and pro-protectionist ideology to be absolutely bad for the health and wealth of the nation. How being pro-labor is actually portrayed as anti-labor through this revised language, and it is being asserted 
not to be interest in the interest of the growth and sustainability of the labor as well so while understanding this parallelly one could also draw the genealogical framework as uh, professor uh, patel and professor das gupta has already talked about and even professor arun kumar that the genealogy genealogical framework that talks about the event that have play, taken place as the ideological transformation took place from collective protectionist one to more of the one which champions flexibilization so the effort to include every casual temporary seasonal uh, seasonal kind of paid engagement as work at the level of international discourse and within the nation has become a reality so largely the attempt has been to establish a flexible labor market with the melting boundaries as well as the wavering trajectories to include the employment relations coherent with the profit motives uh, i'm no way claiming that this phenomenon is new but what in this what is the contemporary addition of the same is that this movement is sustained by the state by many ways such as the heavy deregulatory activities weakening of legal fabrics modifying institution and uh, very importantly flexibilization uh, with also introduction of uh, uh, one can say short term employments easy hire and fire etc so citing uh, nancy fraser and her idea of uh, flexibilization has has become of significant important uh, importance with respect to my work so what it entails that the hallmarks of flexibilization uh, could be understood as the temporal horizon of no long term provisionality as well as fluidity so once we look the employment relations and other related things through this lens what we see that endorsing a non standard and atypical form of employment uh, policy has become normal as as normal as the formal employment relations and a renewed recognition of in, informal employment is there but with an add on to normalizing the uh, inherent pernicious component it entails okay so uh, now bringing the focus on uh, as i uh, said the international categorization of non standard forms of employment uh, which has broad components such as temporary employment and uh, it may constitute fixed term employments also um on call employment casual nature of work work done on daily basis part time basis on call basis etc so the international the reasoning of the international governance structure like ilo uh, and the confirmation of non standard employment relations are indeed a matter that needs to be debated so what we have observed in the present times according to the ilo and other such organizations the growth of non standard employments is somewhat they claim that it it is a is it is an outcome of multiple forces it reflects changes in the world of work brought about by say globalization or social change ilo also agrees at times that laws and policies have also encouraged the use of non standard forms of employment but merely by identifying non standard forms of employment and categorizing the same in different forms it seems the international governance structure is not only downplaying the issues of vulnerability and precarity attached to them but in the process it also justifies the existence and showing little intent to discuss about say abolition or replacement with a more protected forms of employment and as we have witnessed that ilo has uh, mostly taken a moral high ground historically at least on papers so that's not even happening now so international governance arena discusses about the gaps and gray areas of the law and policy that have provided fertile ground for the development of non standard work arrangements but does not indicate the need to check the proliferation of the same while there is what we see is the global movement towards re-regulating the worker protective laws and establishment of uh, flexible regulatory measures surprisingly you know what we witness is the eerie silence of, over this absolutely disquieting movement where just about any kind of work absolutely overshadowed by the clouds of insecurity precarity invisibility is not only you know overlooked but um, they are also normalized to the extent that all kinds of problematic aspects related to on call temporary contractual and many other unsettling employment arrangements are finding place and legitimacy in our legal framework 
as valid forms of employment. So we can see these uh, labor codes, I'm not going into detail, but once we go and deconstruct the language of the labor codes, you will find even the gig work and uh, on call and everything has been pro uh, given equal uh, status as the formal employment in terms of its recognition, but not in terms of its betterment. So the attempt of this techno autocratic alliance is not on focusing on how such arrangements minimize or more people tread the path from precarity to more secured forms of employment. Rather, the trend what we are seeing in India is uh, that outright there is outright acceptance. There is normalization, of course, and there is promotion of such arrangements in the name of more people getting involved into economic value creation. Looking at the nature of work and employment relations and its interaction with the impacts of law regulation and politics, inherently it has been observed that the state in the contemporary environment marks, marked by a promoting and thriving free market constantly argues and enumerates the positive relationship between business profitability and public good to the extent of deriving a significant positive correlation between growth of the capital vis-a-vis -vis the unsecured nature of the employment and connecting all to the common good. So what is more unsettling for us as academia is witnessing, also witnessing a wave of researches and theories with or without being endorsed by the regime, some being endorsed, some not being endorsed, but they confidently assert two very, very um, problematic arguments. The first one is, uh, of course, the foremost and the biggest responsibility of the state is to safeguard the capitalist interest. And the second, the idea of regulatory employment protection is mythical. It's irrelevant in the present world order. So much so that it goes on accusing the protectionist legislations to be problematic and should be replaced with immediate effect, with a framework that does not put burden on the capital. And arguments like such add a great deal of connotation of goodness to the capital and imposes detestation for the attribute of pro-collective and pro-protectionist uh, regulation. So this binary, what I feel needs to be substantially rebutted in the present times by all of us as the labor and, and employment framework honestly in, is in a deep crisis and in, in the state of existential turmoil in India. While completely changing the socio-legal and techno-economic milieu of the labor and employment fabric, it is argued by the state also that if the employer and employee are both granted a set of non-restricted, non-restrictive legally enforceable claims instead of highly protective provisions of legislation, their respective positions are safeguarded in the market economy. So such arguments have placed in, uh, you know, uh, they have a placement which is indicated through a movement towards doing away with the worker protective laws under the appearance of productivity and growth. So in India, there are many, many attempts to link this inverse relation between protective legislations and the production, while arguing that laws that increase labor security are not gainful for the worker either. So there are many significant studies which have profoundly, I can, I can share uh, with the team, there are multiple studies which I have referred to, which are uh, talked very highly about in uh, various academic and uh, socio-political domain, and they have profoundly ignored the precariousness and vulnerability question of the worker. There have been claims from the side of state through such you know, academic and regulatory endeavors too, that reform shall increase the employment percentages, and they have been abnormally silent on the issues of the nature of jobs produced, the wage dynamics, the social security coverage, and leave alone the aspect of collective bargaining power of the work that we are not even in a position of talking about. And unfortunately, even that the state has moved into the direction of working on a heavy regulatory endeavor with complete dilution of law and institution and so on, the the projected large number of employment generation that was claimed remains a utopia even in present times and in future as well, which the proponents otherwise kept claiming. So uh, wrapping up, uh, cutting the long story short, because one, we, one can go on uh, speaking uh, on this, but we also need to historically observe, apart from you know these four labor codes which have come, which have totally been like pro-investment uh, and anti-labor, uh, how the traversing of socio-legal standpoints on the, on the labor has taken place in the country. So it's not a very new phenomenon. It was happening from a very, very long time. And the way these ideological shift has taken place is also very interesting to uh, observe. 
from the time of first National Labor Commission, which started in 1966. Uh, so it elucidated a blueprint which highly talked about, you know, the workers' collective consciousness and uh, protection fabrics and the strengthening of the court system, the tribunals, etc. Uh, putting impetus on protectionism, collectivism, extensive. Uh, jurisdictions on labor legislations, etc. Um, we also see many of the very important uh, case laws and uh, many important landmark rulings which happen in that era, uh, such as uh, if I could recall, one is Bharat Bank versus employees of Bharat Bank and also the very, very famous Bandhua Mukti Morcha case among many others. But the shift was so rapid from National Commission on Labor one to the to the second national commission on labor which uh, initiated its work in the year 1997 to 1999 where we see the only aim was on the rationalization of the existing legislations and making it more investment friendly uh, and through the landmark rulings and through the uh, through the you know uh, common law traditions we see that uh, even the courts, even the judiciary had a very, very pro-capitalist -capital language. Some of the case laws which I would like to recall here is, uh, of course, Babu Matthew versus Union of India, and a very important case, which is Balco Employee Union versus Union of India and others, wherein the Supreme Court opined that the courts are not to interfere with the economic policy, which is the function of the expert. It is not the function of the court to sit on the judgment over uh, matters of economic policy, and it must be necessarily left to the expert body. So what we see that the shift has been very uh, rapid, but the shift has been there for a long time. And um, I think I'm already, uh, I've already um, consumed all my time. So just to uh, wind up things, I would just like to say that we also need to see a lot beyond the four labor codes. And there are many things which, you know, doesn't meet the eye. It's just a tip of an iceberg. So uh, talking about so many things, which has, uh, uh, as uh, Vibhuti Ma'am has also said that many state has gone ahead with the with their flexibilization process like Gujarat, Haryana, Maharashtra, MP and many others. I mean, uh, hardly I feel any state is left out. The self-certification schemes for the employers, the changes proposed in the factory laws, the changes in apprentices law, the, the uh, introduction of fi fixed term employment to all the all the sectors. So these are the things which are, you know, which are the complex process of transformation of the projects of labor, uh, labor and employment flexibilization. And, uh, you know, this also need needs a more, you know, redefined and more uh, renewed approach for us as critical thinkers to understand it way beyond the uh, you know the neoliberal lens it is essential to acknowledge this hybrid uh, process of uh, re-regulation and decentered regulation and neoliberalization uh, through which these changes are proposed so the underlying fact is that it works in diverse ways and uh, which extends and sustains it also so the attempt of the critical theory has to be to work with multiplicity of methods and ideas and not not only to scrutinize, but also to challenge these strategic manifestation of projections, which has great destructive potential against the democratic setup and also the whole idea of the people-centric approach. I had so many things to say, and I yearn to talk on the subjects of um, uh, where we need to deconstruct a strategic manifestation of projections vis-a-vis -vis actual realities, but I leave it at that and uh, we may just come back for the uh, more on discussion round and I would like to end my presentation here. Uh, thank you so much. Everyone. Thank you so much, ma'am. I would now request Professor Arun to come in for his concluding remarks followed by a Q&A session. Given the time shortage, should we take some questions before I make a presentation or should I make the short, you know, comments and then do the question answer? What would be better? Well, I think we're running out of time, right? Extended.